All right, guys, let's jump into it. I want to speak from uh, nine leadership qualities that I have seen outlast and outpace seasons. And on top of that, to be clear, off the back of yesterday's uh, title, in no uncertain terms, these are nine qualities I want to see more present in our church leadership. So, and when I say our church, I, you notice that I used to say a lot, our organization. I just really believe that the church is more than that, obviously. And I want to even encompass uh, our current endeavors with Renee under that. Obviously, it is a uh, different kind of endeavor in, the, in a sense, but it's still part of it. So that's what we are. And I want to see these nine qualities, these nine leadership qualities in just growing measure across every single part of our church. And so here they are. Number one, flexibility. Man, leaders that are flexible, that leadership trait of not being wrecked by change. And it's not even just change. It's just flexibility. Life happens. Things happen. Meetings change. Uh, milestones can change. Like it's a dynamic environment. And I've just watched people that, man, the minute your flexibility starts to become rigidity, just your attitude starts to change. You know, you, you become people step on eggshells around you. They can't cancel something. They can't do this. They can't do that. They can't introduce new. You know what I mean? You introduce a new objective and they're like, their world's just, I'm, I'm dying. Why? But, but we said, one of the least flexible statements is, but we said. <laughs> now I get it if like it's seasickness kind of level of like, hey, we're, we're building here. No, no, we're building this way. No, we're, we're a home group church. No, 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 we're a mega church. No, 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 no. We are a church now that just is more rabbinical kind of focused. That's what we're doing. That's new. So everybody grow out your sideburns and curl them. Like, that's what we're doing. I get that. But I always say that you know how big someone is by how small a thing it takes to derail them. Yeah, so my question is, in your flexibility meter, like, does a literal calendar change derail you? Yeah. Does it start to mount up? And hey, the way you test someone is not once, mm -hmm. but multiple times. If, if like one change doesn't mean you prove like you, you know, you pass a test. It's how flexible are you? Are you agile? Ords once preached this message back in Pritzker days and she said, if you won't bend, you'll break. And there's, a, there's just a great art in a leader that is flexible, that has the ability to just move with the day, move with the moments. Now, no one's talking about a lack of organizations. No one's talking about people that just can't commit to, you know, to their word or any of that nature. But are you flexible? Are you flexible when a meeting has need for a different direction? You know what I mean? Like I might come in, there's been many a time where I come in with a challenge in mind that needs to happen in our church. And then, I don't know, I've got staff members that are going through it. Or there's been something different happening on the ground. And if you're not flexible, honestly, the person that breaks is you first. And then the people around you. So like the ability to be flexible as a leader, I think is so 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 uh, so necessary. One of the things that um, I really I love watching public speakers. I love watching leaders under the microscope. And one of the things that I was very impressed with the uh, vice presidential debate was Vance's ability not to just say things, but his um, calm, emotional calm. You just don't see that in many leaders. They were both far more calm than their chosen leadership, <laughs> to be honest, for the first time you actually got two people talking but about something. But the reality is Vance's ability to stay emotionally calm, I can't, eat, I can't do that. I don't do that well. And I thought that is an attribute more than intelligence or anything like that. It was such an internal fortitude and value. When you are flexible, you are able to, I'm asking, how do you handle change with calmness? I always watch when a change happens in a meeting, if the person starts malfunctioning, you know they may malfunction. They might not say it because we're all grown ups and we know that that's going to be called out, but their little eyes start pinging all over the room. I thought we were, I thought we were like, calm down. Can you take change with calm? Can you adjust your plans when necessary? And then a good leader knows the thing with flexibility is flexibility still needs planted, right? Because 
Flexibility is when something in your body is staying whilst the other part of it is bending and that's what creates the necessity for flexibility. So we're not talking about getting off track or losing sight of what the goal is, but it's the ability and the wisdom to know this requires some flexibility right now. And also, is my response to a moment of flexibility disproportionate to what's taking place? Like a moment of flexibility where we're bending for a meeting or two, or it's been a crazy week or whatever, that is a moment of flexibility. But if that causes you to start feeling like your world is in flux and we've got no rhythm anymore, I think that's disproportionate. You have to be a leader with flexibility. Number two, resilience. You're the leader, right? Like you are the standard. You are the person at the top. And over the years, I've just watched leaders that will, in Australia, we say, create a storm out of a teacup. You know, just a storm in a teacup. Like, anything is happening. It's chicken little world. The sky is falling. Oh, my God. Like, I'll never forget. I think it was Madden or Kingston. I think Kingston was our third, Audrey's third C-section, not mine. I've never had one. But... um, Audrey's C-section and, no, it must have been, it was definitely Madden because we had never experienced this. So anyway, Madden's in the, in the hospital and because he hasn't gone through the normal birthing situation, all the liquid hasn't been like squeezed out of his lungs. So, you know, all of a sudden he starts choking and I'm like, I hit the buzzer, the nurse comes in and she walks in calmly at first, right? And then all of a sudden she starts saying this as she's holding Madden. Oh God, oh God, oh God. I was like, I wasn't like nervous because I was like oh we got help here this is the hospital this is where people are trained but when the people that are trained start saying oh god like I've got a rule if I see police officers run I'm running you know if I see people like at venue control at a concert running I'm running with them and my point is you're the person that's meant to be strong and if the minute your area comes under fire. And when I mean minute, that minute can be the you know, colloquial term that we have these days, which was like, man, it's been a minute. I don't care if that minute is 10 years or two minutes. Mm-hmm. If you are under stress and do rest and you don't have the resilience, your team is looking to you. Yeah. That's what, we're, so if I put you in charge of something and, and Shannon, like, what I will say with Shannon, she's very poised. Like, yeah. Even when she delivered that news of like, we've got $17,000 coming in and that means that we're about $70,000 short (laughs) monthly. Uh, That's where we're at. I appreciate it. Because I've also had business managers where the sky is falling. Mm -hmm. And they're so nervous that I'm like, well, what strength are you to this ship? Mm. You are there to steady the ship. And if you're going to steady the ship, you need to be resilient. So how do I classify resilience? When the tough season doesn't change you, it enhances you. I want to see more steadfastness in a tough season from you if you're resilient. I want to see more conviction if you're resilient. If every time things get pushed off or you don't see what you want, you crumble, I just don't think you've got leadership traits. Because whilst leadership, everybody can desire leadership in the perfect world. That's like saying I could score a thousand goals if there was no goalkeeper and the ball came straight to my feet. But that's just not the reality of the world. And I think you're a leader because you have an innate ability to go first. And if you go first, guess what? It's not charted. You don't know what to expect. You are there to navigate the unexpected, which means you must be resilient. If you are the first person to get negative, down and out, and think of aborting the mission, I'm sorry, that's not resilience. If the minute you are under fire for more than what you feel comfortable, Mm -hmm. you start to become and ditch your character traits that everybody celebrated in good seasons, Mm -hmm. you don't have resilience. Mm -hmm. If you start giving up on yourself, if you question the vision, if you question if it's actually doable, if you start saying statements like you see more giants than you see grapes, Mm -hmm. referencing obviously, you know, as they spied the land, like are you Caleb and Joshua or are you everybody else? Because... I think there's too many people that are like, we are grasshoppers. Mm -hmm. And I've just seen that so much in leadership. And note this, they were all confident until they saw the giants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you might be a confident leader, 
But if in every meeting where vision is presented, where goals are set, the previous season of how long it took and how difficult and all, the, and all of a sudden you see yourself and your team and the odds of you winning like grasshoppers in the sight of giants, I'm sorry, like that kind of resilience just won't, they, that won't cut it. I can't be the one nervous. In fact, in all of our biggest seasons, I have to be the one and I've tried to be the person that is calmest. I had to be calmest during pandemic. I have to be calmest during our church falling apart because of the racial uh, conversations that were happening and the media really just being so evil and using it to get ratings in many ways. Like all that time, I had to be calmest. If I'm nervous, I can't imagine what everybody else will be. If you're nervous, I don't see why your team should stay in there. Sometimes you are the steady legs that they don't have. And I think resilience is how long can you come under pressure without pressure changing you yeah. or your path? True. Resilience is how long can you come under pressure without pressure changing you or your path? Third one, I think that is definitely one that is a hallmark of a great leader that I want to see more of in our church and is hope. Mm -hmm. We need more leaders that are good with hope. Mm -hmm. I think if you look through the leaders of time, you know why there's so few of them? Because everything that they're doing is raging against hope. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Martin Luther King saying some of the statements that he said rages against hope. Mm -hmm. For the time that he was in, it just doesn't seem like it's what it is. And if you look at any great leader that's a a achieved anything in any like season of their life, I think hope is the trait of a leader. They're like, I just feel like I can hope against hope. I, uh, we could do this. Like, there is a possibility. And I just watch a lot of leaders, right, where it just gets too personal. And they, 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 they just get rattled because it's like, maybe I'm not the leader for it. Maybe there's, and they start looking inward. Hope is about what you see ahead of you. And I think if, if, you know, like even right now, Renee's got a tight milestone, a real tight milestone, and it's getting real. I want to see a leadership that sees hope, that says, well, look, it's crazy, but we're going to find a way. Why do you think you can find a way? Because hope is a great navigator of obstacles. Yeah. And the world needs more leaders that see hope. Like, and I will say Maddie has done this so well. Maddie took over a team that had four previous leaders mm -hmm. and nothing looked hopeful in it. And she kept anchoring to hope. I see that this could be a team. Yes. The could be is what fueled Maddie and people follow hope. Mm -hmm. And here's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. The right people follow hope. Yeah. Do you want a hope-filled team or a team of negative people? Because yeah. negative people stay outside the land in the wilderness and hope-filled people go places that don't seem logical. I know that there's a time for sobering thought, right? But I think that all of these come under the presupposition that you're not a leader that is detached from reality. Yeah. That's not what I'm saying. Because you can't have hope if you're detached from reality. You just have delusion. Hope stands when there actually is a good grasp on reality and you're like, this does not make sense. Audrey, I think, has been a great leader of hope in the worship team. It is one of the hardest teams to build because everybody wants a platform. It's one of the hardest teams to build because creatives can be very a tricky bunch. It's been built multiple times. She's wanted, to be out of, she's wanted to be out of it multiple times and yet she's gone back in. And I think what worship was on Sunday is a result of... Good, good leadership. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I think we would all probably go, there's multiple leaders right now that we would celebrate. Mm -hmm. And I'm celebrating Audrey for the fact that those leaders have had a place to flourish yeah. because hope yeah. made a way for them. Yeah. Hope that this could be better. There was a time where people said, I don't know if we can build a worship team the way we're trying to build it. Mm -hmm. It didn't make sense because everyone else in the country builds a worship team by paying them. Mm -hmm. And here we've got a team that is happy to serve and would feel privileged to be paid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's because there was a hope for it. Yeah. Are you the first person to ditch hope? Yeah, come on. Or are you the first person to grab and bring people back to hope? That's how I know you're a hopeful leader. Mm -hmm. When everybody's getting negative, you bring them back in, you rope them together, and you go, guys, I see the odds, I see what's happening. Mm -hmm. But I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah, come on. I, I think of hope in this way. I think it's uh, David Goggins says, and I think it's a, note, a seal saying that when you 
you know, think that you're at your end, you've only tapped into like 40% or 60% of your capacity. I think that to me is what hope does in the leadership around us when we face adversity. It says, I know right now we feel tapped out, but I believe hope, like I, I believe we can get there. You inspire people to look at things differently. I think most of the time that we say we can't, it's just because we're at the end of our best but not the end of what we can be. Hope as a leader is crucial if you're gonna lead into places that, make, that don't make sense, really. Yeah. Third thing is, uh, sorry, fourth thing, assignment anchored. Every leader needs to be there for deeper reasons than an opportunity or a paycheck. Are you assignment oriented? Like, do you think to yourself, I am leading where I'm leading in my workplace, in my ministry, in my school, in my marriage, in my home as a single, as a stay at home mom, like you're, that's a huge leadership role. Like, are you in all the spheres of leadership assignment anchored? Yeah, that's good. Because here's the thing, opportunities come with the wind. Mm-hmm. Offers come with the wind. Mm-hmm. Platforms come with the wind. But assignments are personal. Assignments are God breathed and given. Assignments are like, I'm here for this reason. If your here is established in something personal and deep, you watch how many people will just naturally call you leader and gravitate to you as leader. Because a leader is an anchor and an anchor is only worth its ability to dig into the soil that it's in. I think I've, I've got a good sense of assignment. Ord's got a sense of assignment. I think Courtenay, Great sense of assignment. You know why I didn't hesitate to put Courtenay on staff as our college lead when she'd only done one year of college? I'll tell you why. She moved here to this city with her family because she felt God moved her here without a home and without a job. She just felt like she was meant to be here. I'll tell you who I would never employ, just doesn't matter what, is someone that doesn't feel like they're meant to be here irrespective of employment. Because, and it's not like a personal vendor, like, oh, you don't love our vision. It's more like, I, don't, I know that there's not a paycheck big enough yeah. to compete with. And I also know that we're not an organization that can make big enough paychecks all the time. Mm-hmm. I believe we will be. I hope that's my hope. I think we've continually trended towards that. But honestly, I just go, man, if, if you would take a paycheck anywhere, that's just not our culture. That's just not us. I want to, I don't care about the paychecks anywhere. This is where God's got me. I want personal assignment. So people looked at me like I was crazy, but I think it's been one of the best leadership decisions I've made to date because college is where it's at. And she's an incredible leader and Blake's an incredible leader and he's taken production in places that it's never been before. Why? I think if you can endure the assignment and endure tough times because you're assignment driven, man, I think you, you, you got something. All I'm saying is that it's much deeper than a paycheck to you. It's a mission mm-hmm. and, and a mission that oh, I already know that everything's going to be better. And here's why I also want to say this. If you're only there for the paycheck, the interest, the, the, the devout nature and the necessity of a leader to just sow into the people, because that's what you're doing, you know, mm-hmm. you're not there to just produce a result. If you're going to be the leader, you're going to sow into people. That needs something deeper than I'm here to just collect and make ends meet. It needs a sense of belief and passion. That is, I I actually watched this. I didn't even know how I felt about it, to be honest. I was on the plane and I signed up for one of those like, uh, you know, you can watch the entertainment that the airline offers. And I think it was United. And, you know, there was just very little to watch. And there was one thing called the golf experience. And this guy travels to different golf courses. I go... I like golf. I watch that. And um, he stops at this one in Hawaii. It's the hardest golf course in the world. And it since has been um, changed leadership five or six times. And there's this guy that is the golf pro there. And he was a great pro at the best school in Hawaii. And he moved to this school. And he has now got maybe seven golfers on the pro tour that came to him as juniors. And honestly, when you look at it, it's nothing but a passion project. The guy is underfunded. No one wants to play this course. It's hidden in a part of the valley that gets too much rain. It's literally a a course in the jungle. And everything about him is this like 
I just, this is my mission. I don't know what I'm doing exactly. I've never been the groundskeeper of a golf course, but I'm running the groundskeeping place as well. And I just have a sense. Now, I don't want his situation. But what I really took away from this man was I aim to be you. I aim to be someone that has deeper ties to whether this looks like a win, whether this looks like an opportunity. I, I admired this man. I was like, you, you are someone that people write books about. You are Coach Carter, where people will be like, man, you turned a basketball team around that didn't make sense. You are like Moneyball, where you had a passion so deep that you figured a different part, way to win. Like, I think that, to me, is assignment-oriented, assignment-anchored. Be an assignment-anchored leader. Don't be in your workplace just to collect a paycheck. This is beyond ministry. We all do ministry. We just do it in different places. Don't like be there because you just can't be bothered finding something else. Ask God to give you an assignment in the place that you currently work and watch how you'll be a greater evangelist and a greater signpost for the kingdom than anyone has ever imagined because of that. Number four or five, I don't know what number we're up to. Um, change oriented. Okay, I'm not asking people in this leadership team to just be okay with change. I'm asking you to learn how to, how to discern and ride the waves of change. Change is a gift that good leaders and entrepreneurs look for and they maximize. The times are changing. They're always changing. Human culture, human like where things are heading, it's changing. And I think something that has modeled that for us in a modern day age is social media. We went from MySpace, where I hated because I couldn't even figure out how to change my music. Audrey was changing backgrounds. I'm like, and I'm not good with expressing myself in written form, so I had no little- Favorite friends? Yeah, favorite friends at time. Oh, people would be dead. Yeah, and in school, you're, you're out of my top 10. You're gone. We went from that, then, Facebook was like the major thing and then Instagram came out and it changed the way we consumed social media and now TikTok has changed the way we consume social media. TikTok is far more interesting and fast moving and also raw. They're small changes but they're changes with society. And I think that too many times we look at change as a threat or we look at change as something that we will respond well to. I don't want that as our value system or culture of leadership. I want leaders who are looking to explore and maximize change for the benefit of what they lead. This is where the times are going and I'm ahead of it. I, I have wrestled with this for a few years, but now I'm comfortable with saying, I don't like the saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I don't subscribe to it. I don't think that what was good yesterday is great tomorrow. And I think, I, I know that I'm, I want to strive for great. That's where I want to go. So we iterate in this church. We iterate means that you don't change the substance of what you're doing, but you look for points of improvement. Yeah. How do we get better? Like what, what change is coming? What change am I missing? Mm -hmm. Look, change is inevitable. Just look at yourself in the mirror over the last 10 years. Change is coming. Mm -hmm. And if you keep putting your head in the sand, Change is going to pass you up and leave you stuck, buried, old, and irrelevant. Mm -hmm. A leader that is worth their salt is a leader who doesn't handle change, but uses change, rides change. Do you know how to ride change in a way that actually makes you and helps you create momentum? Change is a gift and an advantage, not an opposition. Six, blinders. I love, and it has been my experience, that leaders with blinders go further with leaders who see everything. Blinders that are actually by choice, not by default. There's a difference. I'm not talking about being a leader who can't see. I'm talking about the kind of leader who chooses what they'll see. You always know a leader by their eyes. Like a leader, man, sees need. A leader sees opportunity. A, a leader sees giants, but they favor opportunity. And I think that back to the idea of like the giants and the grapes and all that kind of stuff, there was two leaders. And I think that's no mistake. I think leaders are few and far. 
If everybody was a leader, they'd have no one to have them follow, be followed by, you know what I mean? So a leader is in a small subsection of society. And if you're a leader, I think you're a leader because you see the giants, but you just don't give them the same weight that you give opportunity. I think leaders work under the presupposition that obstacles, challenges, and difficulties are everywhere, but they believe in their ability to overcome them and they believe in their team's ability to circumnavigate them. But they are anchored by opportunity. If every time we, you know, a long time ago we, we were having a meeting and I was like, guys, what, what, what should we do about this area? And someone piped up and said, what's the point? I was like, oh, okay, thank you, Mr. Kill the Vision meeting. And I'm like, what's the point if like, you know, like we're probably not going to even be able to do it. And I was like, so you're basically assessing what we should do according to what you think we can do. So we're going to stay limited. But I think that the best way to move is what should we do? What's right? What's good? What's the right direction? In Renee's terms, we had conversations and we were like, what's the right product? Yeah. Like, there was questions thrown around like, what excites you in this? And they were great questions because above all things, we were like, you know what? We're not excited by this. Mm -hmm. So as we started to get excited, what we were innately doing is we don't care about the challenges. We don't care about what's impossible, what's been built. We're choosing what's right. We're choosing not to determine the path with least giants, but the path with greatest reward. Yeah, come on. And the path with greatest reward will always have more giants. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I, th I believe that the greatest attribute of leaders that stand out are leaders who are not blind, but choose to be blinded mm -hmm. to the thing that they're focused in on. Mm -hmm. Blinders, when you apply them yourself, is a decision to put boundaries that create focus, yeah. not putting your head in the sound around the th uh, in your sand around the things that you just don't want to look at. So, do you have the ability to look at a field, know that there's giants, know that there's mountains, know that there's chasms, see the opportunity, and then set some blinders and go, "This is what we're going for." Mm -hmm. There's going to be challenges, but I think the heart of a leader is the kind of heart that is so tenacious that it's not afraid of traversing down some difficult landscapes. Yeah. Now there's difficult landscapes for Shannon right now as she's got to lead us and I've got to lead us through a church that becomes way more generous. Okay, well, cool. Do we back down or do we step up? Do we acknowledge that? Because right now we could say, well, no one in the world really sees more than 20% of the world of the church tithing. Or we could say, I see a church that could tithe. And it's what you camp at that changes these things. So, you know, blinders that are actually, in, you know, they're for a reason. I think blinders are led by a gut for direction that shrinks the emotional challenge of the giants and the exits along the way. That's what blinders do. They shrink the giants and they shrink the exits. It's a gut understanding that this is the place I should go. It's a gut understanding that this app's going to work. It's a gut understanding that this is what kids need more and that youth could do well if we did this. And this might not be a building that anybody would want to buy, but I feel like we could build a great church around it. Like, it's a gut. If you want a good book on gut, secular book, read 10 Steps Ahead. It's, an actual, it's a study on the gut leaders of our time that have built massive things and how they did it through what seemed to be gut decisions on a whim. And then it's the actual neuro neurological study of how the um, subconscious is not a mixture of emotions, it's a collection of information presented at the pit of your stomach kind of telling you there's a reason you're feeling this. There's a reason that you're getting it. It's the most interesting book and if you ever want to know, man, how do I become a more gut-oriented leader? Read 10 Steps Ahead. It will feature people like The Beatles, Prince, Steve Jobs, um, Richard Branson, um, Bill Gates. Just really, really, really great uh, book if you want to know a bit more about that gut side of blinders. The next one is Relentlessness. Relentlessness is marked by the fact that you keep showing up with the same intensity. It's the belief that when it comes to the wall of limits, you won't be the one that breaks. 
are you a relentless leader? Or are you a leader that slows down as the challenges mount up? As the odds mount up? Like, is Sarah a relentless leader? Well, it's easy to be relentless when you're winning. But what is Sarah when she's not winning? That's relentlessness. And relentlessness, I think, is a great exposer of whether you have real God convictions and whether you believe in yourself or you believe in your assignment. Back to the assignment thing. I was talking to Sarah and we kind of came up with this phrase and it was like, you know what, Sarah? And, and I genuinely believe this for every leader. And I've, ha- I've experienced this myself. There was a, when I first got into ministry, I was confident in my capacity and my competency. And that's natural because it's the first time you do the spiritual gifts assessment at growth track. And you're like, oh, well, I, am a, I do have the gift of discernment. I, I, I am these things. And it's great to know that you're something. And for me, who thought I was nothing, it was a really pivotal season in my life. But there came a point where I feel like God needed, to me, under, needed me to understand that, Chris, your competency is only going to take you so far. If you're an assignment-based leader, you take more courage on the calling itself than you take on your capacity and your competency. You realize that what you've been called to is bigger than you and that God would not start a work that he doesn't finish. The Bible says that the good work he started in you, that he is faithful to complete. So when you understand that, you become dangerous to the enemy because you stop being limited by your limitations and you start actually allowing God to prove himself true in the statement that your weakness, in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. So I think that one of the greatest things that relentlessness brings is this understanding that, man, I'm going to show up with even more intensity because I believe in where God's got me and what he's got me doing. And you stop questioning you. I'll tell you what you also stop doing is you stop blaming. And the last thing is you're not a victim. A victim is simply defined by I am where I am because of where I am. I'm where I am because, you know, I got, I got, I got kids. I, I'm where I am because, you know, I don't have enough team. I, I'm where I am because this is the city I'm in. And I'm where I am because, you know, people don't believe in me. Well, look, that's fine for a follower. But I'm talking to leaders. And if you're a leader, then you're relentless. And you're relentless because you have more faith in your calling than you do in your capacity. You won't stop. You show up with the same energy. In fact, if you're relentless... Obstacles fuel your work ethic, not diminish it. A relentless person is fueled by obstacles, not diminished by them. The, last, the next one is endurance. Endurance measured is this. Can you keep up the same pace, not over a sprint, but over a marathon? How enduring is your faith? How enduring is your patience? How enduring is your kindness? How enduring is your vision? How enduring is your strategic like nature? How enduring are you? Do you do you have an endurance? Like you could be tested over years and people would come back to you and go, you have not lost passion. And I say years, but I would say that from what I've seen from some people, it takes weeks. Weeks and I've got a negative leader. Weeks and I've got a negative person coming up to me telling me how this can't happen. Weeks. If you, I mean, I always say, I I just think this. What is the level, back to the belief of what you're in, to the assignment. Did God give you a big vision for what you're doing? And if it's big, do you you not think that it's going to take endurance? You know what I mean? Like it's massive. It's an undertaking that maybe no one's ever done. And if no one's ever done it, there's probably good reason. I'm talking to people that I believe, and I believe this is a mandate on our house, and it's the vision over our house, that we're called to ridiculous. That's why we have the cultural statement, we live by why not. Now, we're not going for what everybody did. I love the saying that I'd rather choke on greatness than chew on mediocrity. And I think if that's the case, like endurance is going to be necessary because you're coming up against someone that, something that's big. Oh, a few things. Not only has it not been figured out, so no one can teach you, it's probably also just big. Have you noticed that there are things that are just 
big and difficult that people don't do. And it's not because they're hard, like hard to figure out. They're just difficult. Like there's not a men, there's not that many people that have run across this country and not because it's impossible. In fact, we learn to run pretty early in age, right? You just keep putting one foot in front of the other. But why don't people do it? Because it's big. Why don't people build churches in cities? Not because you can't figure it out. It's probably minor tweaks from what it is in the suburbs or in the south, but it's just big. Why don't many people go to and start startups? Because it's big. So how do big things get done? Big things, are the, they are not friendly to sprinters. Big things do not feel good to sprinters. No, marathon runners do big. Endurance does big. So if you want to do big, I'm, you're going to have to get better with endurance as a leader. You want to do big things? Well, you're going to have to endure. You're going to have to endure a whole bunch of things in your life. And I'd encourage you, be sober about this. Which points in this area that we're talking about do you go, man, you know what? I've got a lot of these, but man, endurance is not my friend right now. And endurance might not be your friend because you've got the thorn in your side of negativity. Or maybe you've got the thorn in your side of some past hurts. One of the things that will limit endurance is when you have had previous experiences that preach against your current goals. When you've got previous experience that preach against your current goals, endurance will, will dwindle. When you're like, man, I've been in this scenario before and I haven't made it through. I've been here and it didn't happen. I've been here and they never lived up to their promise. I've been here and it ends poorly. When your previous experiences preach against your current goals, endurance is very hard to keep up. But endurance, I think, its ability is to that when everything fades and seasons pass, like I said at the beginning of the title, when that passes, you're still there. Endurance. And the last one is simply this, now driven. You're highly driven by now, not pacified by later. Even in series of change, even in moments of difficulty, the question is, what can I do now? The beauty of being a now person is you're not overwhelmed. Some people are either inspired by later, but sometimes later can be very discouraging. You know, because it feels like you can't do anything till later. And I think one of the biggest things that got me through pandemic was, what, what do I do now? Like all my friends that were pastors were, were, you know, they were starting threads and a lot of them were like, a few of them were really discouraged. They're like, man, I can't do what I want to do till so long, you know, till way later. And what am I going to do now? And I was like, well, that's the question is, I've always been, I just feel more free in those moments because I know I can't do anything. So it takes the load off me who's very competitive and for the first time there's nothing to compete with. I can't, I can't change it. And when you can't change it, there's a, real, there's a simple beauty and calm about just focusing on what you can do now. Yeah. Look, I think it's wise to try and mitigate. It's wise to hedge your bets. But it's also some of the worst things. A leader that thinks too much about what could happen will be stuck and, sent and, and, and put into a spin cycle of what's the point of now. Because so much could change. There's so many things that could change later. Oh, but, but what if it changes? But what if we, oh, what's the point? Oh, everything could change. Yeah, it will. But the question is, what's the best decision now? Do what's right now. Is that the best approach now? Yeah, but man, there's some laws that could change later. And if they change, they change later. But I've watched a lot of things not change. Some things apparently imminently, just no way they're not going to change. Don't change. And people that stayed the course now are ahead of everybody else. And people that were so driven by what could happen did nothing now. Be, a, be better with your now. I think the only, you'll never be blamed, blamed as a leader for making the best of now. Yeah, but we might not have the staff later, but what do you have now? Yeah, but people might not like it later, but what do they like now? Use now well, and it will always position you for better later. That's what I've learned. Use now well, it will position you for better later. If you do now well, hey, it might, hey you might not get to use it. You might not get to use that message. That feature in Renee may not turn out. I believe in the serendipity of how God leads, out, leads us and how he honors our best efforts and how better is a culture that creates better and how excellence is a way of thinking that only spares, brings excellence. And if you think about this, now is about making use of the ingredients you have. 
So the better you are with now, you're always going to be cultivating better ingredients and better to be at a now situation with something you can no longer use that was still done with excellence. It will set you up with ingredients and tools at your disposal for a better future. So just do now well and don't get so ahead of yourself that you plan your way into a stalemate. Mm -hmm. Just be good with now. Be a leader that does it now. Loves now, forgives now, makes the call now, hits the gap now, gets the website up now. And can I just say to conversations in the framework of what we've been talking a lot about, about say the thing, there's no better time to say the thing than now. One of the things that I've done with my kids sometimes is a mistake and i just, you get tired. I don't want to have the conversation. So I try to have it later. And I don't know if it's just teenage boys, but like they just, I don't think they remember anything after now. You're like, hey man. Yeah, right? As a youth pastor, they don't remember anything. You're like, hey guys, we're going to have youth. And you, they're like Dory, Finding Nemo. They forget that you've told them that we're going to have youth night. And so like, I'm like, hey man, we need to talk about that thing. And they're like, when did that happen? And you're like, what do you mean when that happened? That just happened 24 hours ago. And they're like, and I'm like, tell me what happened. And they're like, oh, yeah. But then, <laughs> hey, but then they'll do this. Oh, that thing. And you get a glimmer of hope. And they're like, oh, yeah, I don't really remember. <laughs> and you're like, oh my God. Oh my God. But you know what? As much as it's, ex- it's, it's exasperated in teenage years, I think there's a hint of reality and truth to it yeah. in all years. And I think it's sometimes really hard to have a conversation with someone when the moment was now. Yeah, so true. And it just they can't fully remember. The feelings aren't there anymore. They can't even tap into what they were feeling in the moment. And before you know it, you're both standing there going, well, if it happens again, I'll talk to you. And it's super awkward now. There is so much power in now. And I want to encourage you, you're your best version now. And my last thought with all of these things is this. Two lot, a thought and a statement. My thought is the best way to get good at something is by doing it. So I want you to go and write practical ways that you could go do all these things and just do them. Do them in public as well. Too many people want to be good at private so that they can be celebrated in public. I'm going to become an expert at this trait in private and then I'll do it in public so that every, I'm going to get really good at preaching in my room so that then when I preach in front of everybody, people are going to be like, that's amazing. The best way to do it is just go do it. Spend more time doing it, reflecting on it, iterating on it and do it again. Do it again. If you're not good at forgiving, start doing it now. You're not good at tough conversations, go have them now. You're not good at receiving feedback, ask for it now. And rather than expecting to take it well, just adopt this. I'm going to be the best at changing. I'm going to be the best at apologizing. I'm going to be the best at growing. That is a realistic marker of a leader that embraces now. And my statement that I wanted to finish with, I got a picture in my head as I was coming up with the things that I really was praying about as to what I want to see more in our church and what I feel has just been a great hallmark of good leaders I've seen whether secular or in the Christian space. And I just got this picture of a sledgehammer and a wall. And I want to say that everything you come up against, if you keep these values, it is a sledgehammer versus a wall. And the sledgehammer, no matter how big the wall is, always wins. I got memories of being really young and I guess the Berlin Wall was coming down or something, or it was, I don't know if it came down already and I was getting re-televised, but I just remember there was these people and they were just bringing sledgehammers to it. And I thought, wow, like, The picture just never left me of how a small sledgehammer can take down a very large structure. It might take a while, it might take a lot of swings, but I believe the sledgehammer wins. Mm -hmm. These principles are going to be a sledgehammer to every boundary in your life and every wall that you've come up against in leadership. And leadership, as you get into leading bigger spaces, becomes far more ethereal than practical. It's a headspace, heart space thing that makes you a good leader. And when those things meet your outworking of them in skill set, now you've got a really formidable leader. I believe everybody can be a formidable leader, especially if you're going to be resilient and have endurance. You'll grow in all the areas that you haven't maybe seen wins in. That's my style for you.